Greetings and welcome to this webcast. This is a test. I am here, as you can probably see, uh, I'm on my boat. And since this is a pre-recorded talk that's coming up, it's a good one, I thought I might try a little intro and meditation with you in one of my favorite environments here on the Potomac River. So let's give this a go. Um, if, you, if this works, I think this is a fun way to introduce a talk I've already done. So, uh, you can hear the eagles over there on the other side of the river calling each other. There, there are two over there that I, that I saw a little while ago. And I'll be quiet. I'm talking back and forth. Before we begin, a few thank yous. First of all, a big thank you to our producers, to Glenn Harrison and Leo Gemo for making this possible. Um, a big thank you to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for streaming this. A big thank you to our Mindful Movement teacher and Mindful Dialogue leaders, to Rita Moran and to Ray Manioki and Tara Cassidy. If you'd like to do Mindful Movement to prepare you for this meditation and talk, that's happening at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. And afterward, if you'd like to join some really cool people, guided by two really cool people, consider joining Mindful Dialogue. It's a wonderful way to connect. Those links are on my website and on my Facebook page. Um, so that's 6.30 Eastern Standard. This starts at 7.30. Mindful Dialogue at 8.30 Eastern Standard. Also, I just want to send a note of appreciation to my good friends at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington. I understand they may be um, actually live streaming the talk there. If you'd like to watch that with some other people and hang out afterward, what a cool idea. And thank you for your support. Uh, this is all offered freely. It's offered really in accordance with the guidelines of the Buddha, allegedly, that these teachings are priceless, therefore there should be no charge. That just, I just love doing that. And your support helps me to do that. So thank you so much. I also have a newsletter where I share my, my photography for the month, <clears throat> uh, almost always uh, here on the river. And with that, let's explore a little time of sitting and gathering. So you might like to adjust your posture in any way that feels good. Draw your shoulders up toward your ears, roll your shoulders. Now there are a couple of things that you might do in this meditation. Um, you might try having your eyes open and, and with the screen i don't know how that'll work but open-eyed meditation is a real bona fide way of paying attention you, you get to see what changes and right now you can see the the mist beginning to burn off uh, further down on the river so um, that's an option the whole idea with open-eyed meditation is that you are open to the senses. You're allowing in all the senses freely, but you're also cultivating this quality of non-preferential awareness. You're awake, relaxed, and open. So if you like, you can close your eyes, or you can let them be open with a soft gaze, or take in what's around you. And before we move a little bit deeper into the meditation, Take a moment to sense, can you feel or imagine this idea of the witness, this sense of non-preferential awareness, your capacity to observe without judging, without comparing, without trying to make anything happen, just observing what is. And from that standpoint, notice what you feel on the inside. Notice the stream of thoughts. Notice the stream of emotion. Notice the expansion and contraction of feeling tone. Notice the quality of presence. And allow yourself now to relax on the inside. You might soften or relax the forehead, the muscles around the eyes. You might relax or soften the muscles along the base of the neck. And 
Could you soften your belly? The lower back. Down through the floor of the pelvis. And can you feel the length and the weight of your legs? The soles of the feet and the heels. And over the next three exhalations, how much more can you soften all through the inside? Receiving the moment, noting how it changes, how it might shift or move on the inside. you might bring your attention to a, a sense point on the inside to maybe the breath perhaps bringing your attention to the to the visuals or to the sounds or the feeling in the palms any sense point let your attention use this as a way of coming home arriving and resting. What could soften or relax inside right now? Can you name what is here in this moment and sense if you can let it be, let it flow?
You might gently deepen your breath now. Let your body move and stretch in any way that feels good. Once you're ready, begin your transition. Let your body move and stretch in any way that feels good. I hope that meditation was refreshing for you. It was definitely cool on my end. Um, I have really enjoyed offering this series of talks on the seven factors of awakening. It's so powerful to recognize that when one of these faculties isn't present, it's very, very difficult to do what's here. So I hope you enjoy the following talk. Many, many blessings in your practice. And I'll do one more little focus around enjoy and blessings. I ran across this. I wanted to share this with you. Advances in technology threaten to overwhelm young minds to the point of distraction. Students' memories will atrophy because so much information is so readily and instantly available. Students will, will know that a, they will know a great many things, but have learned nothing. Technology is overwhelming young minds. Memory will atrophy because information is so instantly available. Students will know a lot, but they'll really have learned nothing. So you would imagine this would be a diatribe against the internet. Well, no. This was Socrates worried about the development of writing in the Greek alphabet 2,500 years ago. <laughs> Distraction versus concentration is a big, big theme, not just in life, but certainly integral in meditation practice. 
when I was doing uh, some research for this talk and looking for some quotes from the Satipatthana Sutta, on the webpage I saw a highlight of a video of a conversation with Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks, and I, <laughs> I almost clicked it, and I realized, wait a minute, no, I'm doing a talk on concentration. Let me stay with this. Concentration is one of the key factors in, in awakening. What I'd like to talk about with the time I have with you is an exploration of, of what the failure to concentrate is all about. Talk about some of the levels of concentration that you can achieve in your meditation practice and, and how do you balance concentration with mindfulness and with letting be. And then I'd like to end with some kind of tangible suggestions for your practice um, and also for just working on cultivating more of that satisfying sense of concentration in your life. So I think we all are pretty familiar with the failure to concentrate and the consequences. But I, you may know the story of, of why a lion tamer uses a chair in the ring with lions. Most lion tamers uh, in the circuses of, you know, um, earlier years, they died in the ring. But there was one, there was one lion tamer who was very, very successful and he didn't die in the ring. He actually died of natural causes in his 60s. And his secret was the four-legged stool. So he'd have his whip and the four-legged stool and, and he would hold the stool up. And maybe you've seen photos of this. And, and what happens is the lion gets distracted by the four, the four legs of the stool and it's not sure which leg to focus on. And because it can't focus, it waits. And this is what allows the lion tamer to work with lion. Clyde Beatty in the 1900s, was the one who kind of brought this forward. He left to join the circus and he went from cleaning cages to becoming a, a really renowned entertainer. This discovery of the four-legged stool is pretty interesting because I would imagine, like me, you probably at times feel like the lion. <laughs> and not just 10 legs of the stool, you've got 10 things to do today and because of the distraction, maybe you can't get started. We live in an age of incredible distraction. There's so much competition for your attention, if you haven't noticed, and maybe you've noticed too, it gets louder and louder and louder. And so you end up just staring at, at the chair. Where do you start? And when we can't hold that sense of focus, the consequences are can be pretty dramatic. You may know the New Yorker cartoon of these these two guys sitting on the street corner with their brown bags, you know, with their bottles. And one of them is saying, you know, I owned a house in San Francisco and I owned a house in Switzerland. I ran three companies. I had my own jet. And then I switched to decaf. You know, imagine your thoughts are like a web browser. You know, you know what it's like when you're on the web and you just get distracted by all the shiny, shiny things. The other day I was, I was looking for a replacement for a lost water bottle top. And I kind of woke up, who knows how much later, reading reviews of a camera lens I already own. So if you want to ensure a sense of deep dissatisfaction in life, let your mind be run by other people. But if you want to have a little more satisfaction in your life, you can actually learn how to focus and concentrate. It's a, it's a muscle that you can develop. And this muscle of concentration is it's not just giving you the satisfaction of getting things done, but it truly is one of the factors of awakening that can point the way to being truly free and being awake to reality. And so looking closer at concentration can be really helpful. I certainly found it helpful to be, to be more aware of the different ways I can concentrate. Back in high school, a, a friend of my brother's um, told the story of how on his motorcycle, 
He was cruising along pretty fast on a highway. And then suddenly there was a pileup of cars. Um, and the car in front of him was one of the, it was an MGB GT. And if you're not familiar with those, they're really, really low to the ground. And, and as he described it, he knew he was going too fast to stop in time. And he said, everything slowed down. He said, I could feel the rush of air. I could feel the weight of the bike shifting to the front wheel. As I hit the brakes, I could calculate the time to impact perfectly. I felt the front wheel hit the back of the MGB GT and I could feel myself launched in the air. And he said, <laughs> this is so cool. He said, I was absolutely aware of this thought as I flew like Superman over five cars. I thought, this is really cool. But when I land, this is going to hurt. And it did. <laughs> he ended up uh, breaking a wrist and a couple ribs and so forth, but went on to tell the tale. Time slowed down and suddenly the moments got really, really alive. Uh, Daniel Ingram, in his book, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, writes extensively around the deeper levels of concentration or the jhanas and what's possible when you train your attention. And he talked about this thing I had never heard of before, which was how many noticings per second can you achieve? In the space of one second, how many individual noticings are there inside of a second? So a little experiment. This will be just brief. You can close your eyes and take three slow, deep breaths. Relax on the out breath. And when you're ready, choose one of these breaths and notice how many details can you be aware of in one breath? And notice the effect as you cultivate that sense of inner absorption. If you like, you can open your eyes. I find that inquiry kind of mind-blowing. How many noticings per second are there? I believe he says you should go for 10. And that just seems impossible to me. So on a long retreat, I thought, well, let me go for three. Can, can, I, notice, can I notice three elements within one second? <laughs> it's, it's kind of crazy making, but it's really, really interesting. What we're talking about here is samadhi or concentration. It's the sixth factor of awakening. First, establishing mindfulness or non-judging awareness or, or viewing the moment-to-moment -moment experience without the lens of greed, hatred, or delusion. It's about cultivating a sense of investigation, like a, like a fascination, a willingness to kind of break down your moment into all the different components of which that moment is made. It's about cultivating kind of a, a liveness, a sense of determination, a sense of resilience to kind of stay in that moment to moment experience. And it's also about cultivating a certain kind of joy of discovery, a, a, a really sense of, uh, of deep, deep, joyous curiosity about what's arising, a sense of like, I want to be here. Another factor is cultivating calm and tranquility. As you've heard me say many, many times, perhaps the more intimately you relax, the more intimately you can feel. So tranquility opens up the moment. And these are all the conditions that support the arising of samadhi or concentration. And there's a, there's a real tendency, certainly I cultivated this for a long time, to think that, that concentration is meditation. And what you may notice is that if that is the primary objective in your practice, to have moment-to-moment-to-moment -to -moment -to -moment awareness in your meditation practice, it's a setup. Because it will set you up perpetually thinking that you're not good enough. 
it'll set you up for straining in your practice, for, for perpetually thinking that you're, you're failing. And as one of my teachers said, in many ways, concentration is a byproduct of all these other factors. Rather than a beginner's practice, it's about setting the stage for concentration to arise cultivating that sense of non-judging awareness, the willingness to be with what is arising, cultivating a sense of resilience, also a quality of joy, a quality of relaxation and calm. These are the conditions that you can create. And then part of it is that when those conditions are present, concentration is like a gift. It's something not so much something you're working for is something that just arises. So you can think of concentration as really kind of two things. One is focusing, like focusing your mind. But another definition is kind of a gathering. And we tend to think of meditation as, as cultivating laser focus. But you can also think of it as, as a gathering of awareness to come into harmony. And of course, when you begin to practice concentration, you'll notice the distractions that arise, which are really kind of cross purposes of the mind. You're giving your mind a job to do. I'm going to focus on the breath. And then the mind starts thinking about what kind of salsa you enjoy the most, green or red. You bring your attention back to the breath. And a few moments later, you're thinking about the first time you had a really, really hot salsa and what you were going to do. So what, of course, occurs in concentration and one-pointed awareness is it reveals everything that isn't here and now, or it reveals everything that moves, these, these, the multiple concerns in your mind, the, the multiple emotions, the, the stories that come and go, all the unseen, unfelt aspects are suddenly highlighted as a byproduct of concentration. And so you realize that when your mind is fragmented, the mind can't settle. And then the question becomes, how do we settle the mind? Because the mind will go in all directions simultaneously. 50,000 thoughts a day, just churning. So the antidote is simplification. Breath, just this breath. Of course, you can use any anchor. You can use sound. You can use the feeling tone in your body in this, in this particular tradition. But coming back to the simple experience of just this breath, where do I feel this breath on the inside? What you'll notice is that there are times in your life when concentration is effortless. Think about when you're absorbed in something you really love. You, you get access to that flow state. Everything falls away and you're just there. A really good book, a, a really good movie, a really wonderful meal, time in nature, playing with animals, moments of really, really deep intimacy. You're not trying to concentrate. There's just this sort of upwelling of the moment happening by itself. And so in meditation practice, when you may not have such a, an easy access to, to a concentrated flow state of the mind, kind of what happens is that we have to look for skillful means. And part of that is relaxation, kind of relaxing the outer layers of the problem-making mind coming back to the simplicity of here and now and the breath, or here and now and the sounds, or here and now and the, the sense of aliveness in the palms and fingertips, that will over time develop a more of a sense of, of natural concentration. The analogy that's so helpful is if you've ever trained a puppy you get this cute little adorable puppy and you say, sit. Puppy has no idea what you're talking about. You push her little bottom to the ground. You say, sit, and boom, she's gone. 
The interesting thing about training a puppy is you have two choices. You know, one is to have a stand, have stand over it and punish it if it moves. I don't think anyone feels you're going to get a very well-adjusted puppy. <laughs> but the other is kindness and consistency, recognizing this is what puppies do. Puppies wander. And this is what your mind does. Your mind wanders. And so there really there are many factors here, but one factor is, is kindness. And the other is consistency. Recognizing when the mind wanders, that that's actually a moment in meditation when you realize, oh my gosh, I haven't thought of my breath and how long has it been? It actually can be a moment of mild celebration. You just woke up. And as you come back again and again and again, as you bring that puppy back and you say sit, over time, the puppy starts to sit for longer and longer periods of time. So when it comes to cultivating concentration, there really there are two things to think of. To think of. One is the returning of attention to the object. So when the mind wanders, you come back to the breath, or you come back to sound, or you come back to feeling. It's the art of starting again, as if it's for the first time. Quite often, it's easy to get grim about your practice, and you realize, oh, there I go again, and you want to rush back, try to get a hold of the breath. And it's really helpful to recognize that you don't have to rush back. Part of starting again, and this has been a big part of my own practice, is recognizing, can I make this pleasurable? Can I associate pleasure to that recognition that my mind is somewhere else? And can I actually invite my, my awareness to relax back into the body? And I find relaxing the tongue, softening the belly, filling the soles of the feet, feeling the palms of the hands. That helps to kind of set that stage of calm and relaxation. And then to feel the breath again. That again and again and again, if you look for the pleasure, it's almost like you're kind of rewiring your brain a little bit. Because it can be quite pleasurable to realize when you're tied up in a knot around some issue and you realize that you can let it all go and re-relax and re-arrive and receive the moment, starting over can be immensely pleasurable. So one element is this practice of begin again. But another element of concentration, it's important to point out here, I think, is that it's one thing to re-arrive and start again, but it's another to actually sustain attention. And some people are really good at starting again, but then, of course, that puppy mind is just wandering. And there's something really powerful about sustaining, about, about lingering with your anchor, lingering with the object of your attention. So I had shared in the, this, the former meditation a few ways that are really, really helpful. One is to count your breath. Some find it's very helpful, find, some find it's really irritating. Mostly I find it irritating, but there are times when just counting each inhalation from one to five has a way of entraining my attention back to the here and now. Another wonderful technique is to sense if you can compare the length of this breath with the length of the breath preceding. And here it's like you're throwing a stick for the puppy. You're giving, you're giving the puppy a job to do. And it can, it can sometimes create a real sense of absorption. And you may recall that part of the, the training in the Satipatthana Sutta is to notice when the breath is long, to notice when the breath is short. You're not trying to control the breath, but you're inviting this sense of relaxed, deepening absorption into the experience of the breath that can shift your consciousness, shift the state of your mind, shift your physiology. I think it's important in meditation 
to continually lower your standards. <laughs> there are times when concentration will be effortless. There will be times when concentration seems impossible. But remembering that this is a, this is a practice ultimately of allowing yourself to to bring a sense of moment-to-moment, -moment, relaxed, non-judging awareness. So these two practices of starting again and sustaining can be really, really helpful. One of my key teachers talks about the word steady. What we're cultivating here is steadiness, and this kind of leads into the next of the factors of awakening, of, of equanimity or steadiness. Being steady in your posture as you meditate. Cultivating steadiness in the mind and steadiness in the heart and steadiness in presence. There's so much on this topic of concentration and, and I look forward to exploring more about the qualities of a concentrated mind. It is tr truly amazing, the power of concentration. It's like, it's like taking sunlight and bringing and sending it through a magnifying glass, where it's like give me laser focus. You can burn a hole in a leaf. So much you can do with concentration, and I'll be talking about this more. But I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the ways you can bring concentration in your day-to-day -day practice. Many folks, myself included, find in a daily practice where you're buffeted by all the winds of life that it can be tremendously challenging and tremendously difficult to, to create a sense of sustained moment-to-moment -moment awareness. And, and what I find quite in a very powerful way is the impact of intensive practice. And, I know all the retreat centers are, are shut down right now due to COVID, but if you have the opportunity to do some sustained practice, I really encourage you to do so because some time of intensive practice is definitely going to create a shift for you, but it'll also inform your daily practice. And I remember once doing a month long retreat, which was pretty mind blowing. And in the beginning, my mind was not concentrated at all. And I really felt pretty hopeless about it because the more I just watched the movement of my mind, the more it seemed utterly and deeply, number one, out of control, and number two, shameless. <laughs> nowhere, there was nowhere my mind would not go. But there's something about this practice of training the puppy. You know, an untrained mind is out of control. But as you begin to train the mind with persistence and consistency and with kindness, it starts to sit a little bit longer. So I began to notice I'm actually a little more aware of my breath a little bit longer. And there was a certain degree of really kind of ineffable satisfaction about that. Just that sense of present moment attention. And then I noticed as I was in the middle of a day, in the middle of a week, in the middle of the month, that when I brought in relaxation and combined it with concentration, there was this really, really cool shift. It was almost like my experience began to open up a little bit. I was aware of my breath, just watching my breath. And then I realized there was a little bit of tension in my belly. So when I kind of softened my belly, Suddenly there was this flood of, of awareness and feeling in my belly that just felt so alive. As I continued to explore concentration as my practice, I also explored, because we were doing the metta practices, or the, the kindness, the, the, the well-wishing practices. I thought, well, what if I take my concentration practice and I... I kind of blend into it this sense of, of kindness and compassion and empathy and joy. And again, they kind of opened up my experience a little bit. 
So what you may find is when you combine concentration and relaxation, it opens up some really, really juicy spaces. That, and they're, they're, they're paradoxical. Someone once said to me, am I supposed to concentrate or am I supposed to relax? I thought about it for a moment. I said, yes. They seem contradictory. Concentration, we think of as kind of a willful, focused, laser quality. And we think of relaxation as sort of more open and spacious and more like the ocean and the vast sky. Combine them, though. Deep relaxation with concentration can be really, really juicy. And in that same way, if you can focus on concentration, focus on the breath, and bring in a sense of well-wishing, a sense of compassion or kindness, that also can be really, really juicy. So what I'd like to do is to, um, to explore just a little, a little practice with you, exploring what it's like to combine these different qualities. So, so if you like, you can close your eyes. This will be a grand experiment. And as someone once said, there are only three possible outcomes here. You're going to feel better, you're going to feel worse, or you'll feel the same. So prepare yourself for one of those. And as you close your eyes, notice where you feel the breath on the inside. And if you would now, for the next three breaths, notice how intimately you can feel the breath on the inside. And now, if you can sustain attention on the breath, and, and really what that means is, if you notice the mind wandering, just bring it back, start again. Feel the breath. And just sense through the body what could soften or relax right now. Could you in any way soften your belly? Could you soften the palms of your hands, the backs of your hands? Could you relax the soles of your feet? Could you relax your tongue and your lips? Take a few moments to explore what it's like for you to blend this sense of deep relaxation and calm with concentration. And now, if you wish, as you feel the breath, let the breath be your anchor. How intimately can you feel the breath and perhaps to blend with it a, a quality of kindness, a quality of deep care? How intimately can you feel the breath blending in a quality of, of compassion or kindness, a quality of loving presence? Take the next minute now just to experiment on your own combining this sense of one-pointed attention with this quality of deep relaxation and or this quality of kindness and loving presence.
What do you feel on the inside right now? And can you make room for this? Can you allow this? You might now gently deepen the breath. If you like, you can let your body stretch and move in any way that feels good. If you like, you can open your eyes or you can remain with them closed. I, I hope you got a sense of that. And there's something very powerful for me when I realize that part of the practice is embracing the paradox of deep relaxation with this quality of alertness and one-pointed attention. It's almost like relaxation is almost like the fuel that allows concentration to happen. And in that same way, one of the key techniques for, for deepening into access concentration in the jhanas is that sense of one-pointed attention blended with loving presence or metta, kindness, compassion, and joy. So a few suggestions for your meditation practice in addition to these of cultivating relaxation, cultivating metta. If you have one particular anchor that you use, you might experiment using different objects of focus. If breath is kind of your go-to practice, try using sound. Sound can be such a cool anchor. Because I always find that when I, when I use sound as an anchor that it helps to open up awareness of impermanence and not self because you realize the sounds are beyond your control. You realize that all you can do is simply receive the sounds as they're happening. And you'll recognize that they're not personal. They're just passing through. At the same time, sometimes using the palms, fingers, and thumbs as your anchor or the soles of the feet can be really powerful. They can be, be very grounding, particularly if you find yourself really buffeted by, by lots of emotions or strong mental states. That sense of feeling deeply into the palms, soles of the feet, if you feel it right now, it almost like it shifts the center of gravity from the mind down deep into into the soma, into the body. And one of, my, one of my favorite things in walking meditation, when I remember, which is not all the time, is that you can do walking meditation very, very slow, and you can sort of note, you know, lift, move in place as you're doing walking, you know, naming the sensations. But if you're walking outside or you're walking fast, is that you can try using concentration on the different sense stores. As you're doing walking meditation, let the primary focus be on sounds. And just take that in for a little while. And then you might shift your attention to, to the visuals, noticing color and light and negative space. Then you might shift to the kinesthetic, to the sense of what your body feels like as you're walking through space. And then you might open your attention to smell and sense what it's like to hold that as your primary anchor. Taste is a little bit challenging, but you can play with that one as well. So rotating the, the objects of focus can be, can be a really, really helpful way of making the practice fresh. Sometimes I find in my meditation that it's really helpful to set a strong intention in the beginning to use concentration as a way of gathering, as a way of arriving. And then you can widen and broaden your attention, explore mindfulness, explore resting in presence. And a great technique, um, if you have Insight Timer, the access to the app, is you can use interval bells in your meditation. So quite often I'll use, um, I set mine for five minute interval bells. So for the first five minutes, I might focus on real focused concentration. And then the next bell, I might widen my attention a little bit and then widen it even more. I have found as well using um, the slow motion movement of the hands practice 
very, very helpful just to sense how how intimately can I feel that slow motion movement of the hands. It's a very powerful way of cultivating absorption. And the absorption has a very pleasurable quality to it sometimes that will lead to this sense of concentration that feels less effortful and more of a sense of concentration from the inside out. You can also notice that when you are distracted and when you're upset, try concentration. That is to say, when you are feeling really, really angry, what if you brought your attention just to the breath, three breaths on the inside? And notice how that sense of gathering might shift your relationship to the anger. And rather than being angry, you might find it more possible to be with your anger. Counting breath from one to five can be very, very helpful. If you want to take it out there, you can do longer counting periods. I also find comparing the length of this in-breath to the length of the in-breath before, again, moving to that sense of a more easeful sense of concentration. So those are some of the techniques that I have found very helpful in my practice, but a few suggestions on cultivating concentration in life. And again, think of yourself as that lion with the, the four legs of the stool, not knowing what to focus on. And what you can do is choose one thing you're going to do. And one of, the, one of the coolest stories I ran across is the CEO of a big tech company who, who realized he wanted to lose 60 pounds. So he decided he was going to do one thing, and this is the one thing he did. He plotted his weight every day on an Excel spreadsheet. You know, he weighed himself in the morning, he put it on an Excel spreadsheet, that's it. Just that one thing. And, and what he noticed was, over time, he didn't make it a big deal that he, he wouldn't have the third donut. Or he noticed that he would park his car a little further away from where he was shopping, so it got a little more walking. And he said it was a two-year process, but just that one thing helped to create a shift for him. My, my go-to practice every morning is I write down the three most important things to focus on for the day. I have about 150, but when I write down the three most important things, then I circle the most challenging one, and I do that one right away. That has made such a shift from tackle the hardest thing, get that sense of accomplishment, and then the rest of the day becomes a lot, a lot easier. And I just tell myself, if these three things get done, it's, it's a great day. When you're in doubt, start on one small thing, just one small thing. I've taken on this uh, practice for the last year and a half of cartooning, just we're doing a cartoon every day. And believe me, <laughs> many of them are not very good. But there's so many times when I'll just sit there and it's like, I got nothing. I just got nothing. But I'll open my iPad and I start. Sometimes some, some interesting stuff comes through. So concentration is about one-pointed attention. It is sort of the antidote to, to a fractured mind. And giving the mind a job, give the puppy a, a job, can be really, really helpful. And just like you can't make awareness happen, you can cultivate the most optimal environment for it to happen. Concentration doesn't happen just at a snap of the fingers. Consider these factors of awakening. Mindfulness or non-judging awareness. The capacity to investigate and really be with the, the granular quality of your inner experience. Cultivating energy and resilience. Cultivating a sense of joyous discovery. Cultivating a sense of calm and tranquility and relaxation. These are what sets you up for concentration. And then... When you're in that concentrated experience, sometimes it can be with a sense of ease, but the attachment to the outcome is the challenge. Concentration is not so much about working harder, but it's about stepping back and cultivating a sense of relaxed and gentle focus. 
if you stop trying so hard and instead allow things to happen to you, is a big shift. I'm just a minute or two left, but I wanted to share this one little reading. When an archer is shooting for nothing, he has all his skill. If he shoots for a brass buckle, he's already nervous. If he shoots for a prize of gold, he goes blind or he sees two targets. He's out of his mind. His skill has not changed, but the prize divides him. He cares. He thinks more of winning than of shooting, and the need to win drains him of power. In that same way, if your goal is to experience a concentrated mind, it's so helpful to remember all of the skillful means that can help you shift from straining to try to make it happen to cultivating an environment where concentration can arise. Ultimately, a concentrated mind is a calm mind. It's a mind that can help you open to recognize what is absolutely true, what is real, and it's a quality of mind that can cultivate a heart that can hold what you find. And so as you sit in your next meditation, you might take some time just to reflect on on what cultivates the most optimal environment for you. You might explore ways that you can prepare your body so you can relax and really arrive and feel. When the mind wanders to remember this quality of starting again, and then to look for ways that you can sustain attention on the object of your focus. And ultimately, concentration is here to open you to the present moment, to recognize the mystery of what it means to be alive. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I I truly hope that this is helpful in your practice. May you and your mind have a wonderful time together, and I look forward to being with you again soon. Take good care.